Man, I'll tell you what, your, your bio, that there's something on here that really, really stands out. And, and that's why I'm grateful for having you. But here's what's really cool. He is known as a thought leader in player development, curriculum creation, and teaching method, methodology. And so that's why when, when I, I, I could add a million MBA guys jump on this call and teach and show concepts, but the way he designs curriculums, the way he develops coaches, and his teaching methods are so good. I really, really wanted to just show some hardcore skill sets, let your guys' wheels get turned and see in the film, and then let him run with this, let him be the guru and really dive into some developmental concepts, bigger picture. And I think now we'll really start to see the difference between skill sets or skill development and player development. So Tyler, thanks for jumping in. It's all yours. Man, Phil, my friend, thank you for having me on. And thanks for that generous introduction. One thing that I think everybody that's on this probably already knows about Phil is that Phil really has a heart to give back. Um, and he's doing this thing for free. He's been doing a series in Phoenix for coaches. And uh, Phil, you really inspired me with that. In fact, both of my daughters, my six and eight year old daughter, were wearing their Be Better, Be Different shirts today. <laughs> and so every time I see him wearing their shirts, I think of you and think of uh, how you just want to give back. So I'm thankful to be able to give back as well and excited to hopefully serve some coaches here on this call. I'm going to share a story with you and you're all going to type what your answer to the question at the end of the story would be. When I was first starting my coaching journey as an assistant coach, um, I thought I knew everything like many young coaches and young players do. And a mentor coach of mine, a gentleman by the name of Sefu Bernard, Sefu might be seeing this recording in the future, he's now um, on staff of the Washington Mystics. Um, he asked me a question because I was talking to him about how to teach the skill development of passing. And we were getting deep into the technique and the physiology of it. And Sefu answered me this question. He said, Tyler, when teaching someone new to the game or when developing a new passing skill, what should be taught first? Should it be the physical technique of making a pass, a one-handed pass, a pocket pass, cross-body flick, whatever? Should it be the physical technique of the pass or should it be the read of when to make the pass? And I'm gonna pass that same question on before I share with you where we landed. I'm gonna pass that question on to everyone. What do you think should be taught first when a player is learning a new skill? The physical technique or the read? What comes first? Of course, we all agree both are important. Let me share with you where what Safu shared with me and then where I've landed now. And it's really going to be the central principle that I hope everyone gets to take away from this little time I get to share with you about player development. Safu at that time said, Tyler, the read comes first. And it, uh, we fought about it forever. because, like, well, it doesn't matter if they make the right read. If they don't have the physical skill to actually execute on the read, they're still going to end up with a turnover. And that was really my first lens, my first view in what it meant to be a developmental coach, because I was a performance coach at that point. I wanted someone to get on the floor and be able to perform. If you can't do it, don't practice it. Don't train it. Just get better at what you're good at. And what Safu was really opening up to me was like, hey, first, we've got to open up their mindset to when to do something and the physical will follow. Now, here's where I would propose right now. I would propose the third door. It's not the read or the physical skill first. It's tying both together constantly. And like Phil said, you know, we might use some different terminology or language and some of the things that we're sharing, but here's what I would suggest as a central principle um, to player development. Player development is when you add the skill development to the read, to the decision, and you develop the skill and basketball IQ together. Now, of course, there are times to separate those things out when you've got to level certain things up, but that, in my opinion, is the difference between just skill development and player development is adding everything else in. And Phil is one of the most detailed teachers that I've ever been around. His skill development stuff is unbelievable. He's a master at it. And so I would really encourage you to avail yourself of the resources he has there. What I want to share with you is going to be, like Phil said, more concepts, ways to teach player development, how to layer in reads to whatever skill work that you're doing. So that being said, I'm going to fly and I'm going to share my screen right here. Let's go ahead and dive in. 
Um, this is the savvy player development. And uh, I'm trying, like, you can be tech savvy, like you can be business savvy. I want to help coaches be more coach savvy, bringing practical wisdom to traditional thought. And so I want to give you five specific concepts that you can bring to your player development. Um, the overall principle of this is I think we need to zoom out before we zoom in so then we can zoom back out and see our progress. So here they are. The first principle, the first concept that I wanna share is this concept of compound interest. So often we want to see immediate results. We want an immediate return. We live in a, live in a microwave society. And we see that with our players as well. And what that tends to do is that tends to cause us to train things or develop drills or appreciate or celebrate when players do things right. But the key to compound interest to exponential growth in any sort of player development is players getting things wrong. And in order to level up, in order to get, get a new skill, they actually have to do things wrong for a while. And so three ways that you can create a process in your player development around compound interest is to know that when you're doing player development, you've got to allow and even encourage good mistakes. Good mistakes are when they're trying to stretch into something new that they haven't done before. So what are real practical ways you can create compound interest in your player development? I wrote three down here and I'll just unpack them very briefly. If you ever want to go deeper, like Phil said, please reach out to me. Um, and I would love to go deeper this is what I do with coaches all the time. So one, have a clear objective. I was at a college practice recently, just like Phil, I got to travel around and work with a college team and the college team was doing a great drill. And so, you know, the coach said, all right, go do this drill. It was a four on three uh, drill where they had to get three stops. Go do this drill. And they did this drill and they competed hard and they played and then they were done and they moved on. And what was missing was a clear objective. Start with why. Why are we doing this drill? If players just play, no matter if the drill is naturally emphasizing defense or naturally emphasizing finishing or naturally emphasizing shooting, if you're not directing their focus, if there's not an objective for them, they're not going to necessarily get better at that thing. One of my mentors taught me, Energy flows where attention goes. And as a, as a trainer or as a coach, it's our job to direct their attention to a very clear objective at the start of this drill. Phil gave you five great skill development objectives, whether it be ball handling, shooting, finishing, movement, change of pace, change of direction, whatever. Well, let them know what they're trying to get better at in the progression that you're doing. Get a clear objective. That will give you compound interest so they don't waste their time focusing on the wrong thing. Second, add an adversary. One of the simplest ways to get compound interest is to find a way to add a defender in to nearly everything that you do. So I'm going to stop this share here and this can be super simple. And I'm going to pull up a video quick of a team I was working with in Texas. And I think every coach um, on here at some point in their coaching career has done some five on O break. And it's often done as a way to get players warm, to get them moving up and down the floor, to pass instead of dribble, whatever your objective might be, all great objectives. But what boggles my mind is what a significantly high percentage of training, skills training, and team practices are done without some sort of guided defense. Because when you, in, when you add guided defense, a lot of benefits occur. So I'm gonna have you watch this video. What are some benefits you would see of doing a 30 second five on O break like this with a defender on the ball and a defender contesting passes and contesting finishes at the rim. Watch this for 30 seconds. And then I'm gonna ask you to type in, what are some benefits of just adding in an adversary to this five on O drill? I'll go ahead and press play now. All right, nothing special about the drill, but I do want you to type in the chat box now, what would be a benefit? What might players over the long period of time get better at if there's just an adversary, a defender in there, as opposed to just going five on O? Now, Sam gave me one privately. He said more game-like finishes. 
We got some more precise passing. Awesome. Matthew making a read. Um, oh, Sahib, we got reacting to the defense. Carter got the effective passes. Yes, Dominic, it does increase the pace. Like we can yell as a coach all we want about go faster, go faster, go faster. But there's nothing like a little competition to increase the pace. Okay, so that's a real simple example. And so what I would challenge all of our coaches on the call to do would be to consider when I don't have a defender in there, why not? And what could I do to just add one in there? Okay, the last thing you do for compound interest is just load things. Every time you come back to a drill or progression, add a load, make it a little bit harder, add a physical load, sprint and touch the sideline after the rep, add a social load, make sure you give a high five after every single rep, add a mental load, um, give a reminder or a piece of coaching to a teammate. Always add a load when you come back to a drill. So many times teams throughout the course of the season, they come back to the same drills and same drills, and same drills, but they don't load them. And when you can constantly load things, you're going to get compound interest. That's where you can zoom out and put some processes in. Okay, I got to pick up my pace. I've got nine more minutes or else Phil's going to give me some coaching afterwards. Um, second one, understand the difference between drill work and game work. Both are important. Drill work is for skill. Games are for reads. So going back to where we talked about having an objective, make sure that your objective lines up with your structure. Um, if you really do want to focus on skill development, that's a great time to do some drills. But the best way to really improve reads for player development for IQ is games. And so you want to make sure that you are lining those things up. Don't overcoach skills in games. And don't overcoach reads in drills. Um, it's very important to narrow the focus and that will help you zoom in. Next one, be real clear with your players what they're doing. Is it a sandbox time or is it war game time? I've written on this uh, extensively. If you want to read the blog about it, just go check out my newsletter at tylercoston.com. But I'll, I'll, this is one of the most powerful and impactful things to free coaches up and to free players up. Sandbox time is when you want them to make mistakes, when you're encouraging them to experiment with new things. A lot of times players in practice are fighting for playing time. They're fighting for more shots. They're, 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 they're constantly competing. And that causes them to stick to what they're good at. And so if we're evaluating players, they're not going to do what we need them to do, which is make mistakes. So we got to say, hey, this is sandbox time. This won't impact my trust in you. This won't uh, you know, make me think that you're not taking care of the ball and making turnovers. It won't impact your shot selection. This is sandbox. I want you to explore the edges of the sandbox here because that's the way players keep getting better during the season. But then you got to be able to flip the switch because you do have to evaluate things as a coach and players do have to know when they need to stick to what they're good at and say, hey, this is a war game. This is where we're going to chest out and try out what we need when we go to war. So now show me your stuff. Now earn playing time. Now earn trust. Now it's a war game. And when we can flip that switch very obviously to our players, it's going to free them up to both improve and know how to perform. And that is an aspect of player development that's often overlooked, especially in season when coaches are just wargaming all the time and expecting to perform, 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 perform. And you wonder why players stagnate. Development isn't just for the off season. That's another thing you can do to zoom in. Here's the third zoom in. Skinny for technique. I stole this skinny term from Molly Miller at Grand Canyon. She said it and I loved it. And um, I would really, really suggest you consider this. Let's say that you're in the midst of a war game, you're playing five on five in your practice and you identify that your, your players are catching and dribbling immediately. They're not even gaining vision. They're not making fakes before they dribble. They're just catching and dribbling, catching and dribbling. What most coaches would most often do is say, hey, we're over dribbling the ball. I want you to make a fake before you dribble. And we would just verbally say that and then go back to playing and nothing would change. Do you find yourself often repeating yourself in the midst of a practice or training session? Why for yes and for no? Do you often repeat yourself? Why for yes and for no? Okay, <laughs> that was, yes, that's, that's the most common answer. If, if a coach put a no in the chat box, I would want their name and number. I want to come watch your practice and learn from you. So coaches hate repeating themselves. So there's two things I think we got to take away from that coaches. One, there's a better way to do it. If we're just constantly repeating ourselves and saying the same thing in the same way and the players aren't changing, that might be our fault. That might be our fault. And I think we also need to understand that just verbalizing something to someone without them feeling it 
is unlikely to make them change. And so what I've found, because that's frustrated me for a long time, just like I'm sure it's frustrated many of you, this whole skinny concept is what I have found to be more effective than just repeating myself over and over again. Look at the rim, look at the rim, stop dribbling, take better shots, don't dribble the corner, be strong, whatever. And the skinny is basically this. If you identify that they're over dribbling and not faking on the catch in the midst of the game, you stop and say, we're going skinny. And skinny means for a very short period of time in a very short period of space, not at a basket. We're going to rep out our catch footwork and catch fake. And so put them in a group of three in a small circle, like the center circle. And for 90 seconds with an extreme focus on technique skill, okay, not read, just skill. They're going to work on their catch, their fake attack and move the ball. 90 seconds with a narrow focus, maximizing their reps. You can see that second point there and being NATO, N-A-T-O. It's an acronym. I stole it from my dad, who's a professional golfer. And he, he said, it's this, not attached to outcome. Because here's the thing. When you do skill work at a hoop that ends with a shot, all of the player's focus is on what? If the shot went in or not, unless they're incredibly mentally tough. Right? They're just like, oh, it's a good rep if I made the shot, it's a bad rep if I missed the shot. And they're not putting their focus where it needs to go on the precision of the technique. But when you take them away from the hoop and you get them NATO and you do a skinny, well, then if you go back to your five and five game after a 90 second skinny, you didn't waste a lot of practice time, or a lot of your training time. Here's what I found players improve the skill. And so I would encourage that's one of the most powerful tools that, that I have discovered and developed over time um, for overall player development, marrying a skill to a player habit in a game. Okay, skinny for technique. Let's zoom back out now. In Olympic athletes, it recently I uh, had the Winter Olympics here, and I was reading the study going to the Winter Olympics. Olympic athletes are elite performers, they're able to get into a flow state in order to perform at a world class level. And a sports psychologist recently published this study that when an Olympic athlete gets distracted or their flow state gets disrupted, it takes them 30 seconds to get back to where they can get to peak physical performance, 30 seconds. Now, Olympic athletes are some of the most mentally tough athletes on the planet. And it takes them 30 seconds to get back to peak performance when their flow state, their concentration gets interrupted. Imagine the athletes that most of us are working with from you know, not Olympic to college, to high school, to, to youth athletes. When we interrupt their concentration, we actually hurt their performance. And so what I would encourage everyone to consider is, can we limit our concurrent feedback? Feedback that's happening concurrently in the exact moment that they're doing it. And can we increase our debriefing? Now, debriefing can look a, a lot of different ways. It probably looks a little bit different for in a team concept or a skills training workout. But one thing that I've actually seen Phil do incredibly well as I've watched him train is he does an incredible job observing. And probably more so than, than many other trainers and coaches that I've seen, Phil will observe, even just a rep, will observe a rep. And when the player finishes the rep and comes to the back of the line or restarts it, he then debriefs it, gives them a focus, and then they go do the next rep better. Um, that is a powerful, powerful tool. If you can save your feedback until after they're out of the rep or when they redo a rep after a mistake, I'll give you a quick framework that you can use in a team. Maybe do it after a small sided game or five on five. You can use it in a training session. Maybe do it after a set of five, 10 reps or, or whatever you want to do. It's the you, we, me debrief, you, we, me debrief. And it's a great way to develop basketball IQ and decision-making because it's, you can't develop that in the moment. You can't say pass to Dante in the moment and think you made them have better vision. So the U is basically this, after a rep, let's say a player attacks, tries to finish something highly contested at the rim and misses the wide open corner kick out. Instead of saying you missed them, what if instead we said, what did you see? Now, chances are they didn't see anything or else they would have made a better decision, right? But just that, that question of what did you see will at least put them back into the moment and help them realize, I, I didn't see anything. I, I need to see better next time. That's improvement, okay? So the, the next place I go with that is we, okay? Like how can we improve? Now, th now this is more of a team focused thing, but how can we improve? What that does is that helps them establish an objective. Remember that's going right back to the beginning here of compounding interest, it helps them establish an objective for the next game or the next rep. 
as opposed to just doing it and hoping they get better by it, by doing a bunch of things. And then the last one would be a me, uh, me being the player, you're coaching the individual um, and, or sorry, me being the coach um, is what's one thing that I, as a coach saw. And when you save it for last, what you're actually doing by saying, what did you see? Or saying, you know, what do you, what do you think we need, we need to get better at? You're actually just kind of preparing the soil to, for you to plant what you think is the most important thing. And I just couldn't help myself. I had to throw this in, no piggybacking. One of the worst thing coaches do is they piggyback, especially when you got multiple coaches in a training session, multiple coaches in a team atmosphere. One coach makes a point and then assistant coach X says, I just want to piggyback on that. No, no, it's already been said, no piggybacking. If I, whenever I'm working with a group of coaches, that's just the rule. There's no piggybacking because piggybacking is distracting. Um, once the point is made, save it and move on. I have got um, one more minute, and this is the last thing that, uh, that I wanted to share with everybody. And I will share this um, I will share this slide with you. Just email me. Phil's going to share my email. Um, he already did. Uh, or my Twitter. I would love to share this with you. Um, but I did this as, a, as an homage to my friend Phil and Be Better, Be Different. Five simple ways that you can be better immediately in your training sessions or practice and five things that I think are different. Okay. I'm not going to unpack them at all. I'm just giving you five quick hitters that are practical that I think you should experiment with. Then we will go to some questions. Uh, here it is. Consider playing a game first. Um, I, keep, I keep going to these college practices and it takes them 25, 30 minutes before they've even broken a sweat. Um, consider gaming first. When you game first, it really gives you a pulse of your team. It really gives you some observation of like, all right, here's what we actually need to work on. And it gives you coaching fuel. You notice in our game, we didn't execute blank. Consider game first. Two, coach through. Instead of coaching to Sam, okay, if I see Sam needs some, some coaching, instead of coaching to Sam, coaching to Sam, I'm going to coach through um, Dante. I'm going to say, Dante, let Sam know that he needs to play off two feet when he has bodies in front. When I coach through, I've coached two people. When I coach two, I coach one person. That'll give you compound interest as well. As well. Player passing. Every time I see a coach passing in a team practice with 13 players on the sideline, it blows my mind. See if you can include player passing in any, and replace your coach's passing. Then your coaches can actually coach. And then your players can actually start to work on an important skill of reading. When can I hit players as they come open and give them advantages? And how can I get more reps? And it will expand their, their IQ as well. Simple way just to get uh, more player development. Fourth, action development. Once you work on your skill development, whether it be a uh, footwork, like the, the ability to stop um, with your footwork off, off of a speed dribble, then do that into an action, an action that you're going to run a lot. If you're going to be running like a ghost screen, um, put your skill work, full speed dribble, stop, no advantage into a ghost screen, into whatever shot you're taking off the mid range, but try to incorporate actions into your skill development that will then also develop the whole player. The last one, quick little one percenter. I love this one. When training free throws, only count swishes, not makes. Only count swishes, not makes. And another tool that I've loved to use is only shoot free throws in sets of one. The hardest free throw to make is often the first one. When you shoot a set of 10, you get into a groove and you never get to do that in a real game. Only shoot free throws in sets of one.